about eight years ago now, one evening in a meeting here at the church, things weren't going very well. Somebody said something that, that rubbed me the wrong way. It felt personal. It felt like an indirect attack on me. And as they, as they kept going, I could feel myself heating up inside until finally I could contain it no longer and I, I lashed out. My words were sharp and cutting. I even pounded the table for emphasis, which is out of character for me. I used some words that a pastor should never use. But when I was done, everybody knew where I stood. And when I was done, I felt awful. I could see the look that were on the faces of the people in the room, that they were stunned, that their confidence and faith in me as a pastor had been shaken because a pastor is supposed to be a gentle shepherd, not a slasher. So as the meeting came to an end and as I was walking out of the meeting with every fiber of my being, I wished that I could turn back the clock and, and undo it, but I knew I couldn't unring the bell. I knew that for the people in the room that night, I could never again be their trusted pastor, and it felt to me like I had forever lost something really important to me. I felt horrible. Then I woke up, rolled over, and realized it hadn't happened. Thank God it was just a dream and it didn't really happen and I cannot begin to describe for you the overwhelming sense of relief that I felt inside of me. Have you ever experienced that? You do something really terrible in a dream only to wake up and realize, thank God, it didn't actually happen and you get this overwhelming sense of relief? But suppose one morning you wake up, you roll over, and you realize it wasn't just a bad dream. But something that you have done that you can't take back, it's real and it can't be undone. Then what? Let's pray. God, every single one of us, during the course of our long life, we're bound to do things that we deeply regret. What do we do then? Speak to us today. Tell us what we need to hear so that when that happens to us, we know what to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This past Wednesday night in a discipleship class here at the church, I explained to the students in the discipleship class that the New Testament Greek word for fornication is pornea, which means sexual immorality. Except on the study sheet that I had distributed, I had a typo. So instead of writing on the study sheet sexual immorality, Instead, I had inadvertently written sexual immortality. <laughs> it was then that I understood why so many students had showed up for discipleship <laughs> class last Wednesday night. They wanted to know, how can I too attain to sexual immortality? In today's... In today's Bible story, David, King David, engages in an act of sexual immorality that would now leave forever an indelible mark on him and be part of his story. In a sense, I guess you could say he achieved a certain amount of sexual immortality, but not the good kind, if there is 
such a thing. Because the truth is, all kidding aside, today's story is one of the darkest in the Bible. But it's there for a reason. We learn from stories, and this story is in the Bible to teach each and every one of us an absolutely critical lesson. You are no doubt aware that King David was one of the greatest kings, one of the goodest kings in the history of the world. He began as a humble shepherd boy, as a teenager who summoned the courage to manage to face, confront, and defeat the giant Goliath with a small shepherd's stone. He managed to take down Goliath, then went on to achieve renown as a great warrior in the land of Israel. Eventually, he was anointed to become the second king of Israel and ascended to the throne after Saul passed away. David united his people like they had never been united before. He vanquished their enemies and he led them into a period of unprecedented economic prosperity. But more important than all of that, David was a good king. He genuinely wanted to do right by his people. And leaders like that are hard to come by. But then came a moral disaster of epic proportions. You heard Nancy read the scripture passage a little bit earlier, how one afternoon in the heat of the afternoon, David decided to go up to the roof of the palace to get a little bit of fresh air. As he wandered around on the roof taking in the fresh air, at one point he had exactly the right angle, the right vantage point to see down into a walled courtyard of a small house where a woman, unsuspecting, was bathing. We're told in the scripture passage that she was an extraordinarily beautiful woman. I can well imagine that when David first saw her, his eyes bugged out of his head like one of those cartoon characters. I picture David's, the expression, the reaction on his face as being something like this. <laughs> he was stunned at first but being a deeply spiritual person, no doubt there was a part of him that thought I should look away. I should respect her privacy. This is not a good thing. But then there was that other part of him that said, I get so much pleasure from just looking at her. I can't look away. And so he stared, he glared, he leered. One thought leads to another, one thing to another. And before long, we're told in 2 Samuel 11:4 that David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. The way the story is told, it is probable that she was not a willing participant, which only makes what he did even more dastardly. And then she conceives, she becomes pregnant, which is a problem because, you see, her husband Uriah was away at the battlefront so everybody would know that the child she was carrying was not by him. When word reaches King David, he, he immediately takes action to try to cover his tracks. He concocts a scheme. He, he orders that Uriah be sent back to him from the battlefield to brief him on how the battle is going when the briefing is over. David says to Uriah, you know, before you return to the battlefront, why don't you just go home tonight, spend the night with your wife, relax and enjoy, you can return tomorrow. But Uriah instead slept in the servant's court of the palace because he was, had a sense of duty and honor. And if all his comrades were on the battlefront fighting, experiencing the deprivations of war, it didn't feel right to him to go home and relax and enjoy. And so he sleeps with the servants that night. David, the next morning, learning this, is very disappointed, but he's undeterred. He urges him again, you should go home tonight. Spend the night with your wife. Enjoy. You can go back tomorrow. But Uriah is insistent. David now is getting desperate, and desperate people do desperate things. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, the commander of his armies, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the sealed letter, he wrote, Set Uriah 
in the forefront of the hardest fighting, then draw back from him so that he, so that he may be struck down and die. What? King David, great spiritual hero, he did what? Joab followed his orders. They put Uriah in the front and they drew back from him. He was killed. Being king, David could have had any beautiful unmarried woman in the entire kingdom. Instead, he chose to destroy Bathsheba's marriage and Bathsheba's husband. And when he woke up, the morning after, and rolled over as he cleared the cobwebs from his brain, he realized this was not just a bad dream. This is something that he had done that he could never undo. Now what? At first it seems that David tried to do what any of us instinctively would do in a situation like that. If you've done something unthinkable, then just don't think about it. Stuff it so far inside that hopefully you can forget it and move on. But things that we stuff inside have a way of coming back to us. And for David, the way it came back to him months later was in the form of a prophet named Nathan who showed up in the court of the king one day saying that he needed to report a terrible crime that had been committed. What is it, David asked? According to 2 Samuel chapter 12, these were Nathan's exact words. O king, he said, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. It grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and even drink from his own cup. It would lie in his bosom at night and was like a daughter to him. But there, there came an unexpected traveler to the rich man's house. And he was loath to take one of his own herd to prepare a meal for the unexpected wayfarer who had come to him. So instead, he took the poor man's lamb cooked it, and served it to his guest. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to the prophet Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. Nathan looked him in the eye, pointed his bony finger, and said, You are the man. David was dumbstruck, and his heart melted like a puddle because the prophet had put it in such a way that David could now feel the full emotional force of the depraved thing that he had done. That sent David into a period, a months-long period of grief and sorrow and repentance during which he wrote the most famous prayer of repentance recorded in the Bible, Psalm 51, where David said in part, Have mercy on me, O God, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Deliver me from bloodshed. Do not cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Create in me again a clean heart, O God. Put a new and a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. I can't breathe. I can't live. I can't feel joy anymore with the terrible weight of the burden of my guilt that I carry with me everywhere I go. O God, please forgive me. And guess what? God did. 
for the rest of his days. David would carry with him in his life certain consequences from the choices that he had made, but his communion with God was restored. His soul was cleansed. And amazingly, God went on to use David, even after these great crimes, God went on to use David in extraordinary and wonderful ways so that David ends up writing more of the Bible than anybody else except the Apostle Paul. And from David's lineage and that of Bathsheba, no less, God eventually gives us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, think of the significance of that, that our Savior Jesus Christ comes through the lineage of this great crime that David committed. In fact, Jesus would himself be known as Son of David. Hosanna to the Son of David, the crowds shouted as Jesus entered Jerusalem on that fateful day. All of which causes me to step back and ask myself, what are we supposed to learn from this? I mean, this is a profound, a powerful, a, a puzzling story, and, and it's there for a reason, and I find myself wanting to sit down in a chair and really reflect and meditate on this story. God, Spirit of God, what are you trying to say to me when this, this great spiritual hero goes so low, but then you lift him back up again? And by the way, this is not the only place in the Bible where we encounter that theme. In fact, one of the most striking things about the Bible as you read through it is how many of the great spiritual heroes of the Bible carry great moral stains on their life and end up doing things that you would think disqualified them. Abraham gave his wife to other men. Twice he insisted that his wife give herself to other men for his own economic protection. Abraham, the father of our faith, did that. Jacob was a pathological liar. Right now in one of our Oasis groups, Pastor Vivian is leading a group that's studying through the Old Testament. They're in the book of Genesis, and she told us this week, she said, people, in the class are stunned by the devastating and awful things that these great heroes of the faith are recorded as doing in the book of Genesis. Moses murdered an Egyptian. Rahab was a harlot. Queen Esther, during a time when her people were slated for execution, wanted to hide in the closet. She wanted to keep her Jewish identity hidden when she was the one who could help them. Solomon took scores of wives and lived an indulgent life. Peter denied once ever knowing Jesus. John Mark was a deserter from a missions trip and yet ended up writing the gospel of Mark. Paul, before he became a Christian, executed Christians and even Mary, the mother of Jesus. There was a point in her life when she doubted her son and tried to give him to give up her ministry. Read about it in Mark chapter three. Are we starting to see a pattern here? Again and again in the Bible, we encounter people fatally flawed that God uses in wonderful ways in spite of them. And it's not just in the Bible. We see it in human experience. We see it in history. Take the example of Mother Teresa. She is probably the greatest saint whose life has coincided with my own life. She created the House of the Dying in Calcutta, India, and started a movement that has blessed innumerable people who were dying when they most needed mercy, most needed help, most needed to experience the love of God. She was so selfless. She was so effective. But then she died. And we got a glimpse of her private letters and were stunned. In fact, she had given instructions that she wanted her letters destroyed when she died, but the Vatican reversed that after her death, thinking it was important that we see what she had written. In one of her letters, she writes to a friend, there is such terrible darkness in me as if everything is dead. After an important speaking engagement, in another letter, she wrote to a close friend who knew her very well, and she said to him, I spoke as if my very heart was in love with God, tender, 
personal love, if you were there, you would have said, what hypocrisy. In another letter she wrote, I feel repulsed, empty, no faith, no love, no zeal. Saving souls holds no attraction for me. Heaven means nothing. How is it possible that this person universally regarded as a great saint, how is it possible that she could have experienced so much doubt and so much darkness in her own life? As someone who is a saint myself, I can relate. <laughs> as you know, I reminded you a few weeks ago that I am a saint, lest you forget. And I can tell you, as a saint, everybody has their darkness. Everybody has their moral stains. In fact, there is no such thing as a saint the way we typically use the term. We all struggle and we're all in this together. And yet somehow God manages to use us in spite of ourselves. Take the example from history of Winston Churchill. If you were to ask me to make a list of, of the 10 people who have done the most good during the course of human history, who God has used to accomplish the most during human history, I think Winston Churchill would have to be high on that list because he was the one who led the resistance to the greatest evil the world has ever seen, the Nazi movement. He was the key leader in defeating that. Where would we be in the world if not for God working through Winston Churchill in those pivotal moments? Yet by all accounts, Winston Churchill was quite the character. For, though some people dispute it, Winston Churchill was thought to have been a drunkard, an alcoholic. Everybody agrees that he at least was one who commonly often drank in excess. Think about that. The key world leader responsible for, for pursuing World War II and defeating the Nazis would drink in excess and then under the influence make world critical decisions. A couple weeks ago, I heard uh, historian Michael Beschloss on TV recounting a famous story about Winston Churchill, about a time when Churchill was coming out of, of a cabinet meeting and, and he, he was confronted by Lady Astor, the first female member of the British Parliament. He was confronted by Lady Astor who, who smelled alcohol on his breath. She said to him, sir, I believe you are drunk. He snapped back at her, Madam, I believe you are ugly. <laughs> and tomorrow morning, he said, when I wake up, I'll be sober, but you'll still be ugly. <laughs> Funny, yes, but not a nice person. Clearly, he had a, a mean, vindictive streak. By the way, don't, don't worry too much about Lady Astor, she could hold her own. She was once famously quoted as saying, I married beneath me, but then again she said, all women do. <laughs> so she could hold her own. But as for Winston Churchill, here is a character, a fatally flawed person that God ends up using to save the world. What should we make of all this? The story of David, all of these Bible characters flawed and yet God used them. What are we supposed to learn from all of this? As I've been reflecting on it this past week, I have a few thoughts I want to share with you and I'm just going to list them out in, in list-like fashion very quickly, but I want to invite you to carry them with you this week and wrestle with what it means. And in our Oasis groups this week, let's talk about this. Let's chew on this. Let's see what the Spirit is trying to say to us through these stories. The first reflection I want to share with you from David's story is this. In your life, you will screw up big time. It's inevitable. So take a deep breath and release yourself from the impossible expectation that you won't have major stains on your life. Is there something or some things that you have done that you deeply regret? Welcome to the human family. We're all in this together.
Number two, second reflection. Never let your sins define you or Satan wins. When we do something terrible in our lives, we typically think, given what I've done, why even bother now? There's no way I can have a successful spiritual life. There's no way God can use me. But what we have seen in the story of David and these other Bible stories today, from what we have seen in those stories, that is absolutely false. A lie of the devil. So, reflection number three. When you sin like King David, ask forgiveness and receive it. Allow yourself to feel God's forgiveness. God wants us to be free. You are absolutely no good to God, to yourself, or anybody else if you're dragging around a thousand pounds of guilt behind you. Number four, know that despite what you've done, God can and will still use you mightily if God could still use David after what he did. God can still use you. And then finally, number five, and I think this may be the most important of the five. If everybody inevitably screws up big time, that means you will never be able to be in lasting relationships with others unless you're willing to do a lot of forgiving as God forgives us. God could not be in relationship with us if God didn't do a lot of forgiving. In human, it is impossible to be in human relationships without doing a lot of forgiving. No way around it. So, do you want to be alone? Or do you want to be in beautiful relationships. If so, you're going to have to get really good at forgiving. I shared with you a couple weeks ago a quote from Reverend uh, Nadia uh, Weber Bowles that bears repeating. She puts it this way, we are all simultaneously sinner and saint, 100% of both all the time. So this morning... I want you to turn to the person who is sitting to the left of you. And I want you to say to that person, you require a lot of forgiving. Go ahead. Do it right now. Turn to the person on your left. You require a lot of forgiving. Now, now you're having too much fun with this. Now turn, turn to the person on your right and say, you require a lot of forgiving. And now, and now point to yourself and say, and I require a lot of forgiving. So with all, with all of these people around us who are constantly committing offenses against us, what are we supposed to do? The Bible tells us, Ephesians 4.32 Forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Because you see, that person who commits an offense against you, your spouse, your parents, your, your friends, your children, your co-workers, your boss, your pastors, your fellow congregants, your friends, those who commit offenses against you, still have within them incredible potential to go on to be a great spouse, parent, child, friend, pastor, co-worker, boss. Just like the heroes in the Bible stories had within them the potential to go on and be great servants of the living God. Many years ago, I preached a really stupid sermon. <laughs> Wasn't the first time, and it won't be the last time. But that sermon I preached that I'm thinking of many years ago offended a number of people. 
Two people were so offended, a couple, that they left the church. That made me really sad because they were an integral part of our church. It was like a tall tree being pulled up by the roots. But then, a couple years later, they came back. I was so happy. Amen. And when they came back, they gave me a card. And in the card, they had written this note. We searched for a perfect church. We tried to find the perfect pastor. Perfection was the goal. But these road-weary travelers were led back home to open arms because for us, we're in the perfect will of God at this imperfect church. We love you and stand with you. I don't cry very easy, but that made me cry. The gift of forgiveness. A second chance. It's like I woke up and it, it hadn't happened. Grace. That was over 15 years ago now. And I'm so glad they came back because seven or eight years after that, one of the two of them passed away at an early age. And it was so meaningful and so important that we could memorialize her life here in this church where she belonged and where we knew her well enough to truly celebrate the beauty of her life. And the other person in that couple is still with us to this day. Hallelujah. You heard her saying amazing grace right before the sermon. We have a lot of precious memories that we share. I remember when her pop, her grandpa, played harmonica for worship service. Yes. He was a Pentecostal guy from the hills of Missouri. But he loved us. Mom and pop would worship with us before we even had this building. One Sunday he played some hymn on his harmonica. Precious memories. And then he died. And we buried him. And then Duty's mom, grandma, died and we buried her. And then Duty's wife died and we buried her. Thank God she has a wonderful new spouse in her life. Beautiful new memories being created. Praise the Lord. That's life. Building lifetime relationships is beautiful but it requires that we get really good at forgiving. As Christ has forgiven us, we are called to forgive one another. I was looking for the perfect church. Drop that word church from that statement. Replace it with virtually any other word you can think of and it will still be an equally unrealistic statement. I was searching for the perfect spouse. I was searching for the perfect parents. I was searching for the perfect children. I was searching for the perfect job. I was searching for the perfect co-workers and boss. I was searching for the perfect pastors and the perfect congregants. I was searching for the perfect friends. Stop sabotaging your life by the illusory search for that which is perfect. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Nothing will ever be perfect, so just accept it. I saw a sign the other day, a photograph of a sign that had these words and this order on it. I like cooking, my family, and my pets. And then I noticed that, that somebody had written beneath this, use commas, they save lives. <laughs> Actually, maybe it was right the first time. Because there will be times when we feel like devouring the people around us. When you get there, 
remember today's Bible story. Let me close with this. There's a, a movie called The Straight Story that tells about the pilgrimage of a 73-year-old man as he traveled to see his brother from whom he had been estranged but who'd, who had had a life-threatening stroke. It's based on a true story. Alvin hears that his brother Lyle has had a life-threatening stroke. For 10 years, they've been estranged. And before his brother passes away, it is critically important to Alvin that he get back to him and that they reconcile. But there's a problem because Alvin doesn't see well and therefore he doesn't have a driver's license. He has no money. He's desperate. What is he going to do? He creates a makeshift trailer and hitches it up to his lawnmower. This is true part of the story. He drives his John Deere lawnmower 500 miles across the middle of America to try to get back to his brother. Along the way, he camps in fields and in the backyards of kind strangers. In one scene, he's camping out in a cemetery in between tombstones when the pastor of the church adjacent looks out, sees what he thinks is a homeless man and carries him a plate of meatloaf and mashed potatoes. They strike up a conversation and Alvin starts to tell him the story of, of what's going on in his life. Alvin says to the pastor, Lyle and I grew up as close as brothers could be. We were raised in Moorhead, Minnesota. We worked hard. Me and Lyle would make games out of our chores. He and I used to sleep out in the yard most every summer night. We'd talk to each other till we went to sleep. It made our trials seem smaller. We pretty much talked to each other through growing up. What happened? The pastor asked. What came between you? Alvin starts to tear up. The story's as old as Cain and Abel. Anger, vanity. Mix that together with liquor and you've got two brothers who haven't spoken in ten years. Whatever it was that made me and Lyle so mad, it doesn't matter anymore. I want to make peace and sit with him and look up at the stars like we used to do. After six weeks of traveling on his lawnmower, he makes it to his brother's town, down the muddy road that leads to a ramshackled shack that is his brother's home. He gets off the lawnmower and calls out, Lyle! Lyle! There's no answer. Alvin starts to think maybe his brother has died in the time it's taken him to get there. But then he hears, Alvin? Alvin, is that you? An old man on a walker appears at the screen door. He invites Alvin up onto the porch. They sit in an awkward silence with Alvin occasionally nervously glancing over at his brother. Lyle starts to tear up. He says, you mean to tell me you rode that thing this whole way just to see me? His face twitching with emotion. Alvin says, yep. And nothing more needs to be said. They're at peace. Brothers reconciled who can gaze up at the stars together again. As God has forgiven you in Christ Jesus, forgive one another. Because the truth is, if we're going to live well, we're going to have to get really good at forgiving. Because each and every one of us is going to screw up big time in life. It is inevitable. God loves us in spite of ourselves. And we should do the same.